So, uh, my name is Peter. Uh, I work at Protocol Labs uh, in the IPDX team. Uh, that stands for Interplan Developer Experience. Uh, and our main goal is to improve developer experience within the IP stewards team. Uh, because we do need them in a lot of places and they don't have that much time. Uh, so, in this talk, I'm going to talk a bit about how we're making it happen through automation. Uh, I'm going to touch on how we automated uh, Kubo release process, how that connects to our migration from Circle CI to GitHub Actions, how you're making GitHub Actions work for us so that it's fast enough and reliable enough and available, uh, and finally, how we are monitoring all of that so that we know where to go next. Uh, so let's get started. First, uh, yeah, I guess that doesn't need that much introduction. I probably already are familiar with Kubo, but for the purpose of this talk, uh, I want to just mention that Kubo is a Go-based IPFS implementation. Uh, that it's maintained by IP stewards, and they do have a great deal of knowledge that's needed in various places around our ecosystems. So whatever we can do to free their, their time up for use in more important stuff than the burden of going through a release process, for example, that that's, has a tremendous impact. Uh, and while we are on the release process, uh, which I'm going to talk more about, uh, just for the record, uh, in Kubo, it follows a monthly cadence. We do have RC releases before uh, each final release. There are some patch releases uh, in between as well. Sometimes there are more than one RC per release. So uh, yeah, uh, as you can imagine, it all adds up and it's, it's time from uh, IP stewards time. So why do we want to automate it? Uh, first of all, uh, with a process as complex as uh, Cooper release process is, which doesn't really entail only releasing Kubo binaries, but also touching on many different uh, other projects like uh, upgrading Kubo in, in different areas or promoting the, the release via multiple channels. Uh, there, it's really complex, so there is uh, a pretty big potential for error, and we do want to reduce that. Uh, we also want to make it more reliable. Uh, as I mentioned before, like we do want, like our main goal is for IP stewards to have a better experience, but also to have more time for more important tasks. Uh, we also want to make the process more scalable because as you can imagine, if it's all manual and with time, it's only getting more and more complex uh, and that doesn't scale really well. Uh, so, what were we starting with? We are starting from a process that was already over 150 manual steps. And like, I, when I first did it, I certainly did miss some steps and didn't, didn't realize only days or weeks after. So that's, <laughs> that the tree does have like a, a huge room for error, which we do want to minimize. Uh, it's really lengthy, and uh, yeah, a, a day to, to go through a release and not being able to work on anything else, that's, that's way too much, uh, especially given that like, a release is not a single event, like there are many stages of the release. So that, that takes, it, it took way, way too much time from IP stewards' uh, time. And also, it was only going to, to get worse with time because we are adding new stuff to it, we are making it more complex and longer. So, what did we come up with? Uh, so the, the problem was that we do have to interact with many, many different services during, during Kubo release. So it's uh, like we weren't able to use just any ready-made tool that's already is out there uh, that deals with release automation. Instead, we had to come up with something that, that pulls a lot of the, uh, all of those services that we need to interact with into a single coherent package. And that's how Kubo Releaser came to be. We decided to, to write it in Go because we wanted Kubo engineers to, to have uh, an easy entry to, to contributing to, to the project. Uh, 
and Kubernetes, what what it really is under the surface, it's it, it just calls APIs of different services uh, that are involved in the Kubernetes and make sure that the steps that were previously manual are now automated. And uh, it also changes the interface that the the release driver has to has to interact with because now all the commands are. Um, <coughs> are grouped together in, uh, into logical groups. So for example, you don't have to do uh, 30 different actions to, to promote release on, on Discord, uh, Discourse, uh, Matrix, and Reddit. Instead, you just tell Kubernetes that now we are at the stage where we want to promote the release. Please do all those things. So it's way nicer experience for, for the person driving the release. Uh, some pretty simples that we followed when, when developing it. Uh, we, we did make sure that uh, everything happens in isolation, so there is minimal dependency on uh, release driver's system. Uh, it all runs in, inside the Docker, Docker container. It, it does all the clones and checkouts in there. It has uh, all the dependencies there, so you, you don't have to worry that the state of your system is going to mess up with the, the release you want to make. Uh, so that's, that's a really nice, uh, nice feature. It's also written in a way that makes sure that the reruns are safe, so we can run the same command over and over again, and it's not going to create a hundred releases for you. Uh, it, whenever it can't do something, because it's not smart enough just yet, it will interact with you and it will prompt you for, for help. Uh, it's also, not tied to, to your machine, so like we do support multiple people coming together to, to drive the release uh, from different machines, which is pretty nice to introduce someone to the release process, for example. Uh, and it also tries to provide very clear documentation. It tries to be really verbose, both in code, in line. Uh, we do think that all the steps that come into the release process should be well uh, documented because who knows where we might go with that yet. Maybe we'll want to get rid of Kubernetes at some point, so it will be nice to, to have it all documented. But also when executing the commands, it tries to be really verbose about what it's doing so that uh, Kubo engineers driving the release don't lose the, the knowledge of how the release is done because we do, don't want to just lose this expertise for a while to realize later that, oh, we might actually need it. Uh, so I think that's, that's really important and it enables, for example, uh, Kubo engineers to, to contribute further to, to how Kubernetes releaser works. Uh, so the, the end product of what we have uh, is a completely new release process that instead of over 150 steps has only 15. So that's pretty nice uh, reduction in just the number of things you have to do. Uh, like all those commands, like as I mentioned, are really logical groupings of things that happen underneath. Uh, so we are much better suited to, to deal with further growing complexity because usually when we want to add something new to the release, it's something to do with those comments we already have. Like, uh, if you want to, for example, promote a release in yet another channel, it's not really a new comment for someone to run, it's just a new thing for the comment to do. So uh, it doesn't put the, uh, it doesn't make it harder for the release driver to go through the release process. Uh, it drives the, uh, the duration uh, of the release process uh, down a lot. Uh, the last time I did the release using Kubernetes, it took me way less than two hours and uh, I was already one foot out the door traveling for uh, home for, for holidays and uh, I didn't encounter any troubles. So I think that's that speaks to the improvement to, to where we started with. Uh, and visually, it looks something like that. So the thing you see on the left is where we, uh, that, that's where we began. And the thing on the right is where we are right now. Uh, it doesn't have to be the end of the road, but even just by looking at that, you can clearly see that the improvement is staggering. Like the, the list on the right, you can probably even 
just look at it and, and have a vague idea what is it going to take to, to do a release. Uh, you can build up context for it. If you look at the things on the left for the first time, you just get scared and want to run away. No? <laughs> Uh, but leaving the release process uh, in the back for a bit, I want to move on to our migration to GitHub Actions from CircleCI, though it is a bit connected because uh, when we started working on automation of the release process, uh, we realized that it's going to be a lot simpler if we can interact with mainly with GitHub API to uh, to complete the release steps. So one less service to integrate. Uh, so that was great. That's how it connects to the, the previous topic. <laughs> uh, but that's, that isn't really like, the main reason why we set out to, to migrate from, from Circle CI to, to GitHub Actions. Uh, in my view, like, the biggest benefit of, of using GitHub Actions over Circle CI in our case was uh, that the experience of using GitHub Actions is much more integrated into where our developers already are, which is GitHub. That's, that's where they spend most of the time. So it's a nice feature that they don't have to leave the platform to, for example, inspect uh, CI failures. Uh, like it, it, it really makes it much more natural to, to interact with all the parts of the CI system. Uh, and for me, that's, that's like the biggest selling point uh, that there is when it comes to GitHub Actions. But as I mentioned, it did also help us simplify it, what Kubernetes releaser became. Uh, it is easier to manage, uh, but that's uh, personal preference. Uh, and also we do have more expertise with GitHub Actions, so it's easier from the perspective of our team to deal with. Uh, and as we found out, uh, it was much more cost effective for, for us, because most of the things we did uh, in Circle CI in GitHub Actions, we could achieve on, uh, on three runners. So how did we do that? That process was mainly manual for us. We did uh, go workflow by workflow, read what it was doing, and try to translate it to what GitHub Actions can understand. Uh, right now, it doesn't have to be, because GitHub came out with uh, GitHub Actions Migrator tool, so if you want to do the same, uh, it's probably going to be a lot easier. Though even doing it manually wasn't uh, that, that bad, because uh, the concepts between the two aren't that different, so it was pretty straightforward. Uh, but we really wanted to ensure that uh, the well-tested workflows that we had running in CircleCI for years are behaving at least the same way in, in GitHub Actions uh, in terms of both correctness and performance. Uh, so we run both CI systems, both CircleCI and GitHub Actions uh, in tandem next to each other for around two months. Uh, we gather some stats on uh, that, that we cared about so that we could compare them exhaustively and be able to uh, back, back our claims with data that in fact, GitHub Actions is a better choice for us. So the benefits we expected were faster builds uh, because um, <coughs> and, and reduced waste time, uh, <coughs> wait times uh, because we uh, we wouldn't uh, because as we found out, like, there was quite a bit of uh, of upfront costs to. Uh, waiting for Circle CI runners. Uh, as I already mentioned, we did uh, found out that uh, we did save save money by this with, with this migration. Uh, what also happened was that that suddenly uh, our our workflows were a bit more stable and re reliable. So we weren't able to pinpoint exact exact source for that improvement uh, because uh, the, the configuration of the hosted runners in CircleCI and uh, 
GitHub Actions, like to some extent, like you, you, you can't know everything about it, but from practice, as it turned out, uh, GitHub Actions runners were, uh, were more reliable. And the metrics we looked at to, to compare the two were, were the duration of, of our workflows, the success rate of them, and, and price that we had to pay. So by the end of this experiment, uh, that's pretty much what we, uh, what we were presented with. Like this is uh, an extract from a week-long monitoring of the two. Uh, so as we can see, GitHub Actions did outperform CircleCI pretty much everywhere uh, in our case, especially the pricing column. Uh, that's a big difference. Uh, there are two instances where CircleCI were like, seemingly a bit better than GitHub Actions, but if you really cl look closely at the numbers, they're pretty much on par, so that's, that's free nothing we, we worried about uh, and that we were confident enough to, uh, to shut down Circle CI after seeing those numbers. Uh, but if you also look at the column uh, that presents the cost of the two, two solution, like one interesting thing that you'll notice is that we are not only using free solution from GitHub Actions and we are on a free plan so we don't have access to, to paid large runners in GitHubs, but we did need faster runners. And that's why we set up self-hosted runners. And that's exactly uh, to, to get faster builds because we wanted, we needed more powerful machines uh, and with self-hosted runners we could get them and that would speed up the builds. Uh, but also it would reduce the time that our workflows had to wait for, for an available machine because uh, you, you only get uh, 20, uh, you can use up to 20 GitHub hosted, hosted runners per organization at any given time. So with us promoting uh, GitHub Actions internally everywhere, like we started seeing that sometimes we do run out of uh, GitHub hosted machines. So self-hosted runners is also uh, a great uh, fit for that. Uh, it can provide uh, better availability also uh, because of this reason, like we can control how many machines we have uh, within our fleet of self-hosted runners. So we can make them available uh, readily to be picked up. We could customize them, though we don't do much of that because we to believe that it's a nice feature to uh, have workflows that can work both on self-hosted and hosted runners. Uh, for example, uh, in a scenario where you fork a repository, it would be nice if you could run it on GitHub Actions hosted runner uh, and because you wouldn't have access to our self-hosted runner feed. Uh, and also, not really a reason why, but I think it's worth mentioning here that we do run our self-hosted runners uh, in ephemeral mode. So they only ever do one job and then just disappear. And that's for multiple reasons. Uh, it does give us, no, make us sleep better at night because that way we know that uh, a malicious job can't just leave something on the, on the runner that would mess with subsequent jobs. Uh, also, like, it doesn't have to be malicious, like you can't leave some, some trash behind you to break future jobs. So that's, that's a really nice, nice feature too. Uh, and how we set, set them up, we used uh, a really brilliant project developed by, by Philips Labs. Uh, they, they use it internally, it's called Terraform AWS GitHub Runner. Uh, it's, it has great documentation, it's a really nice piece of software that like, pretty much covers everything that we needed to do to, to set up self-hosted runners on AWS. Uh, we did modify it a bit like, in, a, in a few areas because uh, for once, back when we started working on self-hosted runners, the, the project from Philips Labs didn't support uh, starting up uh, runners from different, uh, different instance families and we did want to have like that level of customization that we could have machines of different sizes for different needs. Uh, now I think it does, but I haven't checked it out in detail just yet. And also we wanted to have more control over like, what requests for 
self-hosted runners we accept. Uh, we wanted, like, so we added additional filtering level that checks whether the request is coming from the repository that we allow to have uh, self-hosted runners from our fleet. Uh, when it comes to configuration, they, uh, there are they some obvious things we like, do care about and we do look at to uh, decide on what kind of instance to uh, assign to speci specific workflow. Uh, thank you, like it's CPU, memory, network, bandwidth, and uh, probably like one the most important one, uh, the, the uh, disk speed, uh, the IOPS and, and throughput on the disk that is really, uh, that can really change, uh, change a lot when it comes to, to building code. Uh, so to give you some stats, uh, these are the number, the, this is the number of uh, self-hosted runners that we brought up in the last 30 days only for workflows in, in Kubo. So we, we had almost 1,000 runs on, uh, uh, on self-hosted runners uh, and we only had one issue with it. So it's running pretty smoothly and the issue was that uh, GitHub itself was having uh, a bit of a trouble and uh, it, it forgot to send us a webhook. So we didn't bring up the machine that we needed. Uh, but it's a shame that, that we had to wait for someone to report it to us. Like we didn't, us as IPDX, we didn't know about it until we heard about it from our developers. And that doesn't seem like an acceptable solution in the long run. So we started thinking more about getting more insights into what's going on in our GitHub actions. And that's why we developed yet another thing of our own, which is monitoring GitHub actions. Uh, because unfortunately, like GitHub lacks a bit in this area, like it doesn't give you a great deal of insights into uh, what's going on in GitHub actions. Like it, so. Like we had to do, <laughs> we had to go and, and do it ourselves. Uh, so, yeah, we did it. We created a GitHub app. We configured it to, to receive webhooks on the events related to, to GitHub actions, but th that's really a detail. It could, it could receive any events like you could extended beyond just monitoring uh, GitHub actions events. Uh, so we have a service running that listens for those webhooks. Then uh, when we receive an event, we just store it as is in the raw formats in uh, PostgreSQL database because uh, to be quite frank, when we started doing that, we had no idea what uh, exactly we wanted to look for in this data. So we thought, oh yeah, let's just store our data and figure it out later. And uh, as it turns out, that was a great decision. Uh, and then in Grafana, we just query this data directly and, and build up graphs that tell us many different interesting things about the posture of, of our GitHub Actions uh, solution. They help us uh, debug issues with uh, CICD. Uh, it, hel it helps us make decisions about where to focus our efforts next. And that's a real superpower because uh, there's only two of us in the team. so like, we. To, to have like this extra piece of information that tells us which project may need us the most at any given time, that's, that's amazing. And it also helps us optimize the, our current work, workflows. So here's how it all comes together. Uh, like some of the things that, that we look at right now through our uh, monitoring, monitoring solution are for example, durations of the, uh, of workflows and jobs per day. Uh, we look at how long they wait uh, in queue for, uh, <coughs> for a runner to be, to be assigned to, to our workflow. Uh, like even here in the, in the description uh, I, I took a couple of days ago, like you can see that something, something weird is going on with the, the Sharness workflow in the Kuba repository. It's suddenly spiked up to take around 20 minutes. Uh, per job, and that is a bit worrying, especially if you also know this extra bit of information that uh, Sharna's workflow in Kubo has a timeout set out set for 20 minutes. <laughs> so if we were to scroll down here, we would probably see a dramatic drop in the in the success rate uh, of Sharna's workflow there. So uh, yeah, as you can imagine, that the tree gives us. Uh, 
a lot of insight and like it, it gives us information that that's otherwise we would have to rel, uh, rely on on user reports to find some of this stuff stuff out. So overall, what what did we learn through all of these projects and 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 more? Like one one important point that I wanted to make is that I, I believe that. The, it is really useful not to hide expertise from, from developers. So for example, like with the release process, I think that that's is, that was a right decision and it is going to pay off in the long run that we did spend so much time to make sure that uh, while using uh, the new automation tool, like you, the engineers won't lose the knowledge of what's going on. So, uh, that's one. Uh, when we also were developing Kubernetes, uh, I I got to use the GoHit library that I really liked, so I wanted to, to give it a, a shout out. Uh, it's surprisingly complete. So uh, there is, I think, one operation that uh, I needed to do during the uh, Kubernetes process that it didn't support, but for any other needs, like it was there. So yeah, it's really great. Uh, it was a breeze working with Matrix API. It's uh, so much so much nicer to get started than, than for example, with Slack or Discord. Uh, when it comes to self-hosted runners, we did run into um, a few roadblocks for a second. So apparently some uh, third-party services don't always like too many requests coming in from behind a single NAT gateway. Uh, but it's nothing that's uh, a single caching proxy in between can't fix. So uh, that was nice. Uh, it was especially troubling for, for Docker Hub they, because its rate limits are are quite small. So uh, to, to deal with that in our self-hosted runners infrastructure, we just set up a proxy that's now uh, between our runners and Docker Hub that basically uh, acts as a read through cache and stores uh, Docker image layers uh, in S3. Uh, what else? Oh yeah, collecting raw data for Atlantis. That's uh, that was a really smart choice, and I would recommend that. Like if you're not yet sure what you're looking for, uh, and also uh, basing your decision on this data. That's also something I would uh, definitely recommend. Some things in the future for us that we would like to explore uh, fully automating the release process of Kubo because now we do have like, pretty much all of it scripted. So we're just one step away of uh, closing the gap to, to full automation. Uh, we would like to implement uh, alerts from our dashboards that, that monitor GitHub uh, actions because yeah, right now like, there is still uh, it's still a manual process to look through the graphs and try to spot uh, potential um, things that, that went wrong with GitHub Actions, but I guess that, that, will, that will come with time as we learn of more, the, more patterns of uh, what the graded state of GitHub Actions for us looks like. Uh, we also want to get better at distinguishing between what's running on self-hosted and what's running on hosted runners within our uh, monitoring solution because right now they're, it's all tangled together. So uh, like just by looking at some graphs, it's hard to tell whether it's GitHub having trouble or whether it's something on, on our side. Uh, we don't want to uh, open source our dashboards for monitoring GitHub actions. Uh, there's nothing really stopping us from doing that uh, other than, than time. We, just have to export JSONs and put them in a publicly available space. Uh, but yeah, it's more of a to-do for myself. Uh, and, oh yeah, and lastly, we do want to enhance uh, monitoring self-hosted instances in particular, because we would like to be able to, uh, to fine tune the usage of our self-hosted runners more. Uh, we would like to be able to tell whether some resources on machines that we use are underutilized or overutilized and adjust accordingly. And we don't have insight to that yet, but we do have uh, all the data available. So 
Uh, hopefully, that's coming sometime soon. And that's it from me.